God, thank you. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of your love, the son whom you delivered over to death in our place, our advocate, our great high priest. And as we are united to him and united to his death, we cannot die. For you have given us eternal life, and that eternal life transcends even our physical mortality. God, we do not deserve these things. We could not come up with this plan. We could not earn your love. We did not initiate this peace with you. You did all this. And we thank you and we sing your praises for it. And as we open your word this morning to more good news, would you be glorified in our response in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated and turning in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, I just want to put in front of us, uh, once again, our friends in Papua New Guinea laboring to make these glorious truths known to people who have never heard, people with no Bible in their language, people with no local church to attend, uh, the Doe people um, centralized in Maui Roro, but in, in various villages across uh, the, the mountains there in Papua New Guinea, and our, our dear friends, parts of this body of believers who have moved their families, moved themselves over. I got an email uh, from Cassidy this week asking for a part for her washing machine. Now think about that. Your washing machine breaks, and you're probably not washing your clothes in the creek. Uh, you, uh, you go to Lowe's and you get a part, or uh, you call somebody who knows how to go to Lowe's and get a part, and it gets done, and if it takes three days and your laundry piles up, we start to wonder if God is still good. Um, uh, so I got the email because Janet and I are going to be visiting our friends in, in April, first two weeks of April. We won't get to Maui Roro with the part until the second week of April. Contemplate that. It's January, second week of April. Your washing machine might get fixed if I bring the right part and, and it gets fixed. So just pray for our friends. Just remember that the, the, the monumental task of learning a language so that you can learn another language, so that you can preach the gospel, translate the scriptures into that tribal language so that people can hear about Christ. Uh, a privilege we, we get just by showing up and walking through the door here. Um, that's hard enough. And preparing meals, washing clothes, the everyday things of life add to all of that. And, and just remember that Amelia and Elna and Cassidy, those dear ladies, they're not just washing dishes, preparing meals and washing clothes. They're also learning dough a tribal language, um, so that they can evangelize and disciple ladies in the tribe. And so um, their, their, their weeks are, are challenging and tough, and the day-to-day -day mundane things, even when the washing machine works, uh, those are challenging things to do. So just remember to pray for them, and I know you do. Have you ever seen one of those little contests where you have to guess the number of gumballs in a vase, and if you get the right number or closest to the right number, you get all those gumballs. Uh, maybe how many pennies are in this five-gallon jug? And you start to think about how many you could hold in the palm of your hand and multiply out palms of your hand into a five-gallon jug and guess at the number of pennies. Have you ever tried to guess how many grains of sand are between two lifeguard towers at Huntington Beach? That's a whole different number. <laughs> Have you ever tried to quantify grace? To count it, to calculate it, to measure it. The grace of God on behalf of saved sinners is not quantifiable. <laughs> We can't count it. We can't calculate it. We can't count the benefits or measure the results. We can't calculate undeserved kindness. We're going to look at some verses this morning. Our text is Romans 8, 31 to 34. It's 88 words in the New American Standard, 89 words in the ESV. You're wondering, what did they add? Um, the Greek New Testament is 65 words. 
You know, we can count the words. Well, we cannot measure the grace these words describe. And we thought the news couldn't get any better uh, so far of all that we've learned of Romans chapter 8. And yet this morning, we get to read more in verses 31 to 34 of the measureless grace, the incalculable kindness, the limitless mercy of God towards sinners. Now let's read together God's words through the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 31 to 34. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. What great news. What measureless grace. This morning we'll look at the reality of this passage that God's immeasurable grace toward his people highlighted in four monumental truths and their staggering implications. We're going to look at four truth statements of God's grace toward us and the unbelievable implications of those statements. All of these flow out of love. All of these flow out of God's kindness towards us, which is unmerited. All of these flow out of mercy. All of these come to us in spite of who we are and what we've done. This is God's free, undeserved gift of love. The first truth, followed by its staggering implication, is simply this. God is for you, Christian. God is for you. And the implication is that no thing can be against you. This is what Paul says in Romans 8.31. Look at this verse. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? What shall we say? This is a, inviting a response to something. What is Paul inviting us to respond to? What shall we say to these things? What are the these things in verse 31? Certainly Paul has in view the immediate context of 28 to 30. We looked at the last couple of weeks. All these things are working together for good. And then that unbreakable chain of salvation from eternity past to eternity future. This is grace upon grace. But what Paul goes on to describe in the next few verses encompasses not only the trials and hardships just outlined in chapter 8 working together for our good, but also the love of God introduced for us in chapter 5. And the doctrine of justification by faith explained in 3 and 4 with all of its implications flowing out in chapters 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. In short, I believe that Paul here in 8.31 when he says, What shall we say to these things? is referring to the whole of the letter of Romans up to this point. How shall we respond to everything we've been talking about in the gospel? The good news of God saving sinners. The book of Romans is not over yet, but Paul is moved here to reflect on the grandeur of God's grace described up to this point. The ungodly sinner declared righteous and then given all the consequences and privileges of that right standing. What do you say to that? What shall we say to these things? And Paul supplies an answer to the question. And the answer is another question. If God is for us, who's against us? The obvious answer is not even stated in our text. No one. Nothing. Nothing could be. Do you remember when the storm was against the disciples? They were in the boat, and these seasoned fishermen, these men who were accustomed to being on the sea, they were accustomed to being on this lake with its violent storms, were terrified. Jesus calms the storm. He, he tells the winds and the waves, 
and they obey. Remember the disciples' response. Who is this man? What kind of man is this that even the wind and waves obey him? And a great calm came over the whole thing. Listen, if a violent wind stops blowing over a lake, the lake is still moving for a long time. If Jesus says, hush, and both the wind and the waves stop, something scary has just happened. Something scarier than the storm is in the boat with the disciples. Which is why the text there says, and they were really terrified. (laughs) Because something bigger and scarier than the storm was in the boat with them. Remember when the legion of demons was against a man and a whole town. A man couldn't be chained. A man not in his right mind because Satan's henchmen, a whole army of demons was plaguing him, tormenting him. Iron chains would break. And then when the man was set free, the demon's gone and the man in his right mind, the disciples were scareder. Why? Because something bigger and scarier than a legion of demons was right there in their midst. You see, God is bigger and scarier than your trials, your enemies, and your problems. And if the biggest and the scariest one loves you and has set his purposes for good upon you, then you have nothing to fear. If God is for you, who can stand against him? Who could be against you if he is for you? And the bigger your God, the smaller your problems. The smaller your God, the bigger your problems. This verse has an if in it. If God is for us, who is against us? This is not to cast doubt. It's not as if God might be for the believer and he might not. But if he is, then you're in a good place. This is a rhetorical device that sets us up to ask the question. We ought to let the effect of this if ring in our hearts just a little bit. What would it be like if all power... All wisdom, all ingenuity, every resource, every scrap of information was leveraged in your favor. What would that be like? Think about that. Because that is the truth. That's the reality. Believer, that is the truth of grace. God, the owner of all things, the orchestrator of all events, the sovereign over all beings, He is for you. Therefore, anything that sets itself against you is of no account. Any opponent persecuting or antagonizing you cannot thwart the good that God has designed for you. And as we've seen over the last two weeks, every antagonist is actually made by God to be your servant for your good. Consider for a moment the corollary to this truth. What if God is not for you. What if you, right here this morning, are continuing in a state of being against God? How will it go for you? Paul found it difficult to kick against the goads. Do you remember that? He was persecuting Christ. He was persecuting Christians. Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, it's difficult for you to kick against the goads. That is a, an understatement of infinite proportions. If the owner of all things, the orchestrator of all events, and the sovereign over all beings, if he is against you, leveraging all of his wisdom and might against your life and the direction you have chosen, this will not end well. But this is for us. Did you see that in verse 31? What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? This us is exclusive language. This is truth for believers, for God's people, for those who have by faith trusted God's Messiah to save them from sin. For us, since God is for us, who could ever succeed in being against us? It can't happen. A remarkable truth, God is for you, the implication, no one against There's a second monumental truth in this passage with staggering implications. God is gracious. 
God is gracious. The implication, no good refused. No good refused. This is verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What a remarkable promise. This is another question. How will God not give us everything? And the obvious unstated answer is, of course, God gives us everything. Like a freight train speeding up as it plunges off the tracks of a broken bridge over a deep gorge, this question gains momentum as Paul tells us more about the God who gives us everything. Paul doesn't stop short by just saying, God gives you everything. He freight loads that promise with information about the God who gives us everything. Notice what Paul says about him. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. The demonstration of God's grace to us, of God's generosity, of his lavish love, is the cross. The cross demonstrates God's heart of generosity. And God says, he did not spare. He didn't spare. God was not stingy in his grace. He didn't spare. To, to spare someone is what a judge does when he spares a criminal and doesn't give the criminal what their crimes deserve. Or, or parents sometimes spare their children of the correction that is necessary. God did not spare his own son. God did not withhold an ounce of the justice due the sins that the Son bore. He did not hold back one bit. In fact, the Son received the full force of wrath that justice demanded. There was no relief for him. The prophet spoke of this, Isaiah 53.10. The the Lord, that is Yahweh, was pleased to crush him. 700 years before Christ died on the cross, the prophet Isaiah tells us what this servant would do. Would be crushed by Yahweh, a thing that pleased Yahweh, putting him to grief, that he would render himself a guilt offering. A staggering thing. God did not spare his own son. This description of Jesus as God's own Son is is unique. It differentiates Jesus, the unique only begotten of the Father, beloved by Him, from all of God's other sons. That is, us adopted by grace. We are fully privileged, real sons and daughters of the King of the universe by the gospel and the grace of God and by His love. And yet when Paul separates out his only son here, He is not denying the real sonship of those adopted by His grace. He is affirming the unique relationship of God the Son to God the Father. And you know that the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Son in relationship to the Father only. He's not everybody's Son. He's the Father's Son. And and He is the only begotten of the Father. He, He is the unique one. He is the only one of His category. He is the beloved. He is the one in whom God's soul is well pleased. This designates Jesus as the unique, the only begotten of the Father and beloved. And we should feel the tenderness in this phrase, His own Son, as we feel the weight of God did not spare Him. He did not spare Him. But... Paul goes on, he delivered him over, handed him over. This is a a forensic term of, of delivery over unto prosecution, sentencing. What did the father deliver the son over to? He delivered him over to death. He gave him over to the prince of darkness. He gave him over into the hands of his enemies. Ultimately, the son was given over to be a curse on a tree, cursed by God. As he bore the sins of all who would believe, past, present, and future, he became the object of God's wrath and his fury. 
What the Father delivered the Son over to was the full expression of God's fury against every sin that would be paid for on the cross. All in the person of Jesus Christ. Octavius Winslow, in his uh, book, says, Who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father for love. Why did God do this? Verse 32 tells us, He delivered Him over for us all. For, little word, a preposition, in the place of, in the stead of, a substitute for. It was, of course, us who deserved the full fury of the infinite wrath of God, unquenchable in its expression, that we would endure forever and ever and ever in the lake of fire. And it is Jesus Christ who goes in between and takes our place, enduring and absorbing and quenching that infinite fury of the wrath of God so that we could go free. That us there in verse 32 is the same as the us in verse 31. God is for us. God didn't spare his son, but delivered him over for us all. That us is believers. It's the same group of people described in verses 28 to 30. It's the unbreakable chain of salvation. God is working out all things for good to those who believe and called according to his purpose. They are foreknown, that is foreloved. They are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. They are called, justified, glorified. It is for these and for all of these and for only these that God exhausts his fury on the son. This phrase, he gave him over for us all, is exclusive. It is only true of believers in Christ, and it is inclusive. It is true of everyone who believes, from every nation and tribe and tongue, from every background, every status. And for us all is personal. That is Jesus' substitutionary death, his vicarious death in your place, believer, is a personal vicarious atonement. That is, he stands in your place as an individual. Each sinner, each believer's sins placed on Jesus Christ at the cross and Jesus substituted in love for each believer as a person. Jesus' salvation is not a salvation en masse, but the salvation of a a people, individual persons from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. It's not like saying, I need a thousand paper clips and they're $4.85 on Amazon.com. But I want that one and and that one. I'm, I'm setting my personal love on that sinner, says God, purchased by the infinite cost of the blood of Christ, as if that sinner were the only one in need of redemption, and that one over there, personally loved and purchased, and that one over there, individually foreknown and chosen. These are names written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. This is not a matter of indifference, but personal love. And what Paul says here in verse 32 is an argument from the greater to the lesser. Do you hear the logic here? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? An argument from the hard thing to the easy thing. An argument from the greater reality to a lesser reality. Of course God will give you everything because he gave you his son. The cross of Christ is the most climactic and conclusive demonstration of God's favorable disposition towards his people. That is the greater. And what is the lesser in this argument? Everything. Everything is the lesser part of the greater to lesser argument. In other words, getting Jesus, God giving over his son in our place is greater than everything else. And if the lesser is everything, how great must the great be? And let's contrast for a moment God's generosity with our generosity. 
Think about the way we give somebody something really big. And, and we expect them not to ask for anything else. I mean, I gave you everything. What more do you want? That's not God's generosity. What does he say here? I did everything for you. Ask anything. Just lavish love. Immeasurable grace. Unbelievable kindness. And what does Paul mean? God gives us everything. It certainly has in mind the blessings of salvation all the eternal benefits of being in Christ and what it means for us to have infinite, increasing joy in the presence of the radiating glory of God. But all things in this context would include the things like Romans 8.28. God causes all things to work together for good. Those things which naturally might be opposed to us or might actually intend our evil, God intends for good. And and the all things certainly includes the way Paul concludes the end of this chapter. Verses 35 to 39. Uh, Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. All day long we're being put to death as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37. In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer. In them. Not by avoiding them. Not by God removing all these things from your life. But in them... Again, this, this, this rewrites the way we see the things around us. Everything is given and orchestrated by God to complete the good plan He has in store for His people. And in that sense, everything belongs to you, Christian. Everything belongs to you. Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 21 to 23. Remember the Corinthian believers were arguing about which preacher they liked and who they followed and and they were boasting and they were exalting themselves over each other. And Paul correcting that says, let no one boast in men for all things belong to you, Corinthian believers, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. And how could God, being who he is, do any less? He has already delivered over his own beloved son in our place to pay for our crimes because he has chosen to love us. And he chose to love us when we were at our worst. How could he hesitate to give lesser things for the benefit of his children? And so all things, whether they be eternal, glorious, delightful things or things bent on your harm which God intends for good. God has already done the hard thing. It's easy for him to finish what he started in you. There's a third monumental truth in this passage that has staggering implications. God declares righteous. The implication, no one accuses Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. This is forensic language. This is the language of the courtroom, judges, criminals, verdicts. The word here means to bring a charge. This is the word used in in all of Paul's legal proceedings in the book of Acts. Charges were brought against Paul. It is to lodge an accusation. And here the accusation is lodged against God's elect. And such accusations fail on account of three realities in this context. The accusations fail because of three things. The the, the first in this context is that unbreakable chain in verses 29 to 30. The second is the love of God in verse 33. And the third reason these accusations fail is the identity of the judge in verse 33. First, this unbreakable chain makes accusations against God's elect fall to the ground. The accusation may be vocalized, but no one's getting arrested. No one's getting indicted. No one's getting tried, sentenced, or punished. The ones loved by God before time began have been predestined to be conformed to Christ's image. They cannot fail ultimately to look like Christ, and no accusation will be heard that will interrupt this plan. And the ones predestined to look like Christ are born again by the power of the Spirit of God. That's the called ones. 
No accusation will be heard that slanders the work of the Holy Spirit of God or cuts off the eternal life that has already begun. And the ones born again or called are also justified. That is, they are declared righteous. No accusation can override that judicial declaration. Justification is the last word. It's the final word on the moral standing of the foreknown, predestined, and called ones. And the ones justified are, of course, glorified. Their future glory, their conformity to Christ, is guaranteed. That future tense reality in a past tense verb. This unbreakable chain in 29 and 30 is the first reason that none should dare bring a charge. Any charges brought would be absolutely to no effect. Talk to a prosecuting attorney. Uh, You might know one. You will discover that a prosecutor has no interest in a case he is sure he cannot win. Bringing charges that get summarily dismissed only undermines the credibility of the prosecutor. Anyone bringing charges against one loved by God commits prosecutorial suicide by going up against this unbreakable chain of grace. It certainly would not advance your career as an attorney to keep doing that. It would only reveal irrational malice. You'd have to be mean and crazy to continue to make accusations against someone whose defense is so secure. The second reason any accusation comes to no effect is the love of God. Notice in this verse, who will bring a charge against God's elect? To bring a charge against God's elect is to dare to contravene God's choice to set his love on his people. Listen, you don't insult the wife of a world champion ultimate fighter. You don't burn an American flag in front of a Navy SEAL or Green Beret. You don't taunt a mama grizzly bear and tell her that her cubs are ugly. (laughs) And you don't dare bring a charge against God's loved ones, his elect. There's a third reason why any accusation must fail, and it is in the second half of verse 33, the identity of the judge. God is the one who justifies Six words in the New American Standard. Three words in the original. God, the one, justifying. It's brief. It's so crisp and short. Its, Its brevity is arresting when you read it. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? The question rings out. And our minds start to go down a list. A long line forms in my mind. Well, my my parents know some of the things that I've done, some of them. (laughs) My little sister knows what I called her. Some of my some of my school teachers could certainly think of some things to put on the list. A communicative driver lodged a complaint with me this week by using a certain middle appendage on his right hand. My right blinker was still blinking while I merged left. My friends could all mention ways that I've wronged them. They could accuse. No doubt people who might no longer call me a friend could add to the list of accusations. My children. My poor wife could have a longer list than all of those. Big brother, them, whoever they are, big data, Google, the government, eyes and ears everywhere, could bring accusations. Satan, Revelation 12.10 calls him what? The accuser of the brethren. It's a present job description. (laughs) Self-appointed. Who could bring a charge against me? Really, anyone that knows anything about me. God, omniscient, omnipresent. Nothing has escaped his awareness. He has known every action, even those unnoticed by the long line of potential accusers on earth. 
He has heard and seen every thought as if spoken out loud or projected onto a gigantic screen. He has known every motive behind all of those thoughts and actions. But none of these accusations gain any traction in God's courtroom. Why? Because of the identity of the judge who declares righteous. It is God who justifies. God is the one justifying. I remember being so struck by this. Um, In 2007, I was at my desk, and I I wrote these three Greek words on the drywall above my desk in my study. And, And those words remained over my desk there until we sold that house. It's amazing. These accusations fail to bring it out about an indictment or a trial or or a hearing of evidence. They, They go nowhere. The verdict is already in. God has already declared righteous. And believer, you have a spotless record. No crimes committed and perfect obedience always performed. That's your record, Christian as if you'd never done anything wrong and as if you'd always done everything right. And listen, every accusation retreats with its tail between its legs precisely because of the identity of the one making the declaration. This identity is critical. It's one thing for the recess monitor to tell you to do something. It's quite another for the U.S. Supreme Court to issue a 9-0 decision about a matter. One has more weight. And when God, the supreme authority, the final authority, the last judge, makes this declaration, there can be no appeal, no hung jury, no retrial, no rebuttal. It is over. God is the one who justifies. And the implication, no accusation can stand. This is grace. This is not what we deserve. Listen, my parents would be right. My little sister would be right. The middle finger waving motorist, he had a legitimate beef. And Satan can use real facts in his accusations against me. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved me, makes a declaration of righteousness that cannot be undone. There's a fourth monumental truth of immeasurable grace with staggering implications. Verse 34, Christ intercedes. No one condemns. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Again, this truth is introduced with a question. Who is the one who condemns? This is parallel to the statement that God is the one who justifies. Condemnation is also a forensic term. These are opposites. And the unstated, obvious answer is no one. No one condemns. Listen, if no one can bring an accusation that can stand, then the condemnation, which is the, de- which is the declaration of a sentence and the handing over to the consequences of that sentence, that's condemnation, If no one can even bring a a standing accusation, then of course no one can condemn. And where chapter 8 started, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The basis of it is here in verse 34. This monumental grace truth is that Christ intercedes. He intercedes. And he intercedes by his cross work. Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, Rather, who was raised? Paul's not correcting the first statement. He's adding to the fullness of it. The full import of Christ's death is verified, demonstrated by his resurrection. The resurrection is proof of acceptable sacrifice, acceptable purity, acceptable quantity of payment, infinite payment. If sins were piled on him and he was not worthy to actually pay for them, then he would still be dead. Do you understand the connection? Do you understand the importance of the resurrection? 
Here's an illustration. If you decided to wipe out the national debt, take on every individual's consumer debt, pay off every mortgage, every school loan, every car loan, every personal loan, every gambling debt, fulfill every commercial order, settle all financial scores by putting all of the debt on your account. You'd be liable for actual numbers. Not just the idea of, man, I wish everybody's debt went away. I'll just say it so. No, you, you'd actually have all of that red in your ledger. You'd have all of that in your account. You'd be liable for the actual payment of all of those debts. And the wages of sin is death. Our debt to God are our sins. And unless Christ actually paid for them, they still stand. And if he took them upon himself without the coin to actually pay for them all, he would still be under the penalty of death. He would still be reaping his wages. But he's risen. He's out of the grave. He walked out. He's at the right hand of God. This statement of Jesus who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, is a, is a fulfillment of messianic expectations. You can go back and read Psalm 110. He is the high priest. Read the book of Hebrews. And he is not standing at the right hand, or he's not, yeah, he's not standing at the right hand of God. Like all the priests offering sacrifices before him, he is seated. In other words, it is finished. It is done. And is he at the right hand of God with all the authority and privilege and honor of the Godhood and his office there as intercessor, as advocate, as intermediary is the pleading of his own blood on behalf of all believers whom he loves. I purchased them. It is paid for. They're free. He is at the right hand of God as the slain and resurrected one whose death fully satisfied God's wrath. His resurrection proved that God accepted payment. Isaiah 53, 12, he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and he intercedes for the transgressors. Hebrews 7, 25 gives us a reflection on his intercessory work. He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. This present work of the ascended Jesus Christ located at the right hand of the Father is his daily occupation of pleading his blood in our place. Our advocate here, Jesus, on the basis of his own shed blood, proven effective by his resurrection, pleads our case in the courtroom of heaven. And if the Son of God pleads your case, then no one can condemn. No one. And I love the Trinitarian advocacy of God on our behalf in this chapter. The Holy Spirit indwells and seals and intercedes for us in prayer. God the Father declares us righteous and the Son, our advocate, pleads his own death in our place. The entire weight of Trinitarian labor and love is in your stead, Christian. And in beautiful irony, grace turns things around. Think about what this passage declares. Four truths that seem contrary to our experience. I mean, we, we do have opposition. We don't possess everything we might want. We do have accusers, and we are worthy of condemnation. And the four truths, monumental truths in this passage, declare just the opposite of those four things we experience. First of all, we, we do have those that oppose us, those that are against us. Again, notice the list in 35 to 39. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, being put to death, considered as sheep to slaughter, death, principalities, things present, powers, depths, created things. In this list are violent opposition. Vexing antagonisms, 
persecutions, opposers. These are bad things. Cancer of its own nature is awful. Persecution is evil. Broken relationships are miserable. And they set themselves against us. They oppose, they antagonize, they persecute, they vex. These things are difficulties that we bear and at times are extremely grievous. What does grace do? Makes them serve our great interest and our infinite good. And in the hand of Almighty God who loves you, Christian, no opposition can thwart His perfect plan, but can only be made to yield to Him and serve you. Better than that, everything exists, is made by God, contrary to its own design and intention, to do things that a friend would do. We have opposers, and yet nothing is against us. Secondly, we we don't actually have everything we might want. If you're single, you might want to be married. If you're married, you might want to have children. If you have children, you might want them to believe the gospel. If you're sick, you might want to be well. If you're in debt, you might want to have a better financial situation. If you're in difficult relationships, you, you might want to have harmony. All of those are good things inherently, in and of themselves. And, 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 and certainly there are things we might want that would be less than good. But what does the grace of God promise? All things for good. God has already given the greatest good, His Son. How will He not also freely along with Him give us all things? Psalm 8411 says that God does not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. In other words, there might be a, a really good thing that would not be good and best for me right now. And God knows God in His perfect knowledge and in His love for us determines what and when to bring into our lives. And if it's not good, if it's not good for me now, God in His grace directs. And He's directing everything for our good. God is not stingy. God, we've already seen, is unspeakably lavish and generous in His goodness. And He knows exactly what is good and gives freely. Thirdly, we we do have accusers who will bring a charge against God's elect. Well, I can think of a lot of people who might try. (laughs) Unbelievers may lodge accusations. Other believers may accuse us. Our own consciences will accuse us. And Satan. Listen, Revelation 12.10 says it this way. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before God day and night. That's Revelation 12. That's still future. That's during the great tribulation. Until then, Satan still has access to the throne room of God in our day, as he did in Job's day, makes his appearance, makes his accusations, is opposed to the people of God whom God loves. He is called the accuser of the brethren, and he does it night and day, presently. And he's probably right sometimes. And yet the grace of God in justification makes every accusation fall to the ground. God's grace silences every charge. And fourthly, no condemnation. But we're actually worthy of condemnation. Who we are produces the things that we do We know that if you violate God's law at any one point, you've broken the whole thing, and we've broken it in countless points in our actions, in our words, in our thoughts, in our motives. But grace makes us uncondemnable. Jesus Christ, our advocate, our substitute, died in our place, rose again, ascended to the right hand, and makes intercession. And so we do have opposition But God makes everything that is set against you serve you. We don't possess everything we might want, but God freely gives everything good. 
We do have accusers, but God silences every accusation. And we are worthy of condemnation, but God makes us uncondemnable. This is grace, unmeasured, vast, and free. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace. We boast in your grace. We have nothing in ourselves to boast of. We boast only in you. You have not given us what we deserve. Instead, you have given us your son. You have given us access to yourself. You have forgiven our many sins. You've given us adoption and all the privileges. God, may we live in your grace, relish your grace, sing of your grace, and proclaim your grace to a world that so desperately needs to hear. We ask even now, O oh God, that any who are encouraged this morning to seek out what it means to know you, to experience your love and a radical transformation. God, would you be pleased to open blind eyes and even to raise the spiritually dead here this morning? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.